Good afternoon, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Stephanie Shanikan. I am a professor of music at the, here at the University of Missouri, and I also get to be co-director of the Michael A. Middleton Center for Race, Citizenship, and Justice. Um, welcome. This is this is a center where we get to engage in interesting, timely, important um, conversations and scholarship on any of our three pillars, which are again, race, citizenship, and justice. So I'm really thrilled this afternoon that we get to hear from, from two specialists in the area of citizenship. And um, before I go on, I'd like to, to invite you to please follow us on Twitter at um, MU Middleton. Um, so if you're on Twitter, please follow us. Um, our website is um, www.middletoncenter.missouri.edu. Uh, .edu. Um, so please, um, please see our, our upcoming events on our website. And of course, you are invited to participate in other ways um, from our website. I'm always um, thrilled to um, mention and celebrate that our center is named after a, a, a very favorite son of Mizzou, with, uh, Michael A. Middleton. Um, and we hope that all our programming, all our work here um, makes him proud because he's done a lot for, for many of us here at the University of Missouri and indeed throughout the state of Missouri. Speaking of the state of Missouri, we're going to have a lovely um, and I think critical conversation right now with two very important people in the state of Missouri. Um, but to moderate that session and to, to introduce our guests, um, I will um, hand it over to my co-director, the Ruth L. Hulston Professor of Law um, and co-director of the Michael A. Middleton Center, um, David Mitchell. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome. It is great to have you all here for in this virtual space to have this important conversation about the right to vote, um, examining policies and practices in Missouri. Um, the right to vote is a fundamental right and one of which we hold very dear and currently, of course, in which is a lot of reflection and changes going on. And so it is my pleasure and privilege to have two of our Missouri County clerks present for this discussion. Um, and I will introduce them now and we will get going. Um, so <clears throat> first I will introduce Shane Scholler. In 2014, Shane was honored to be elected by Greene County voters to serve as their county clerk. Now in his second term, it is his privilege to continue working alongside a tremendous team of public servants who work diligently to ensure all Greene County citizens are well served. In early 2015, Shane was appointed by Senator Roy Blunt to serve as a member of the advisory board of the Federal Election Assistance Commission. And in addition to his work with the EAC, Shane currently serves as the first vice president of the Missouri Association of County Clerks and Election Authorities. Prior to serving as county clerk, Shane served in the Missouri General Assembly for three terms as member of the House of Representatives, where in his final term, he served as the speaker pro tem to the body. He also spent time in public service early on in his career, serving as a field representative for Senator John Ashcroft and Senator Kit Bond. He later served as a legislative assistant to Congressman Roy Blunt and as chief administrative aide to Secretary of State Matt Blunt, where he developed his passion for fair, accessible, transparent, and accountable elections. Shane and his wife, Mendy, are the parents of Emma, Dorothy, and Johnny and make their home in Willard, Missouri. Welcome, Shane. It's a pleasure to have you. Our other participant this evening is Brianna Lennon. Brianna L. Lennon has served as the Boone County Clerk since January 2019. Prior to her election as clerk, she served as an Assistant Attorney General in the Consumer Protection Division of the Missouri Attorney General's Office before joining the Missouri Secretary of State's Office under former Secretary Jason Kander. As the Deputy Director of Elections and first coordinator of the Election Integrity Unit in the Secretary of State's Office, Brianna worked closely with local election authorities across the state to ensure that elections were simple, secure, and accessible for, for voters. She is a graduate of Truman State University and holds a master's in public policy and a law degree from dear old Mizzou. Woohoo! Both, both of her degrees are from the University of Missouri. And Brianna lives in Columbia with her husband, Scott, and two children, Ryan and Isabel. And welcome, Brianna. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We're very excited. 
So I'm going to begin with throwing out a couple questions, introductory questions. And if the audience has questions, there should be a prompt, a button for you to submit them. But just to get the ball rolling, to get the ball rolling, excuse me, I'm not sure a lot of folks really know what our county clerks do. So if you can take a few minutes to really sort of tell people about the duties and responsibilities of the county clerk, that would be fantastic. So I will leave that to either one of you to start first. Shane, you can start. I was like, we should let the MU grad start first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I was like, and my wife graduated from the MU School of Law. So that's something that her and Brianna um, have in common. And so I think a lot of, of MU at the time that we spent up there when we were first married. But uh, in terms of this office, um, you know, each county clerk office has a little different role in terms of administrative duties, but county clerks in essence are very much an administrative role in the county. So that's why we do election administration. We do voter registration administration. Um, we also do tax administration. Um, this office oversees the payroll and retirement benefit administration for the county. Uh, we also are involved in the issuance of liquor licenses, notary licenses, um, auctioneer applications. We oversee um, as well the retention of not only this office records, but also the county commission records. And so anytime there's, for example, a sunshine request um, to this office or the commission, this office will respond on behalf of either the commission or this office. And so you end up being involved in a lot of different aspects of the county. Um, and as I always say, here in election day, you know, that's the most important thing to the people of the county. But every other week when we issue the checks for the county, that's the most important thing we do on behalf of the county. So. And there is a, a distinction to Shane and I are both in first class counties, which is determined by assessed valuation amounts. Um, but the majority of the counties in Missouri are uh, third class counties. And that means that in addition to everything that Shane just said that we all do as first class counties, they're also the budget officer. So we're very fortunate. I feel very fortunate that in Boone County, we have a county auditor that handles the budget aspects and uh, those issues. but you have to do that as a third class county clerk um, in addition to running elections and everything else. So uh, there's there's a laundry list of things. And for anybody that has been in another county, you may interact with the clerk in a different way because they're a different um, class county. And uh, it's something that's always really interesting when we all have our we, we have an association and when we have our trainings and when we have our priorities being set, everybody comes with a different perspective, which is really nice. Um, but we can also learn a lot from each other and that's helpful. Great, thank you both. All right, well, let's get to the meat of the matter here. The right to vote, voting, and your relationship with the voting processes and particularly the, the pre-pandemic voting. Um, and then during the pandemic, and then we'll in a moment, we'll talk about the, the future of that, but sort of talking about your role and uh, responsibilities with respect to voting um, before the pandemic and then during the pandemic. Yeah, so um, pre and post pandemic, the responsibility somewhat stayed the same, but the administration of it changed. So we're still responsible for, um, you know, ordering ballots, setting up the election, recruiting poll workers, getting our polling places um, managed and set up, and making sure that we're accessible to voters. Once um, really it was a this is perfect timing because we're now a year past, uh, a year and a week past the presidential preference primary. That was really the last election in 2020 that we could operate in a usual way. And I remember, and Shane probably remembers, the day after, probably the evening of the presidential preference primary, everybody was wondering how we were going to do the April election as everything was coming down the line. So, um, this week is kind of the anniversary, I think, of when we were going to court to move the date to the June election. So the first thing that happened in 2020 in terms of elections administration was clerks coming together to petition the appellate courts to move the April election to June. So that was the biggest thing that happened right at the beginning of the year. And that happened partly because the administrative portions, like needing to find polling places, were, were just fading away. When we were preparing for April, Everybody was backing out. We were having trouble finding poll workers. And we knew that that was still going to be an issue. So we started making preparations for that. 
but moving the election to June helped alleviate some of it because people could start kind of um, evaluating for themselves whether they wanted to do wanted they, whether they wanted to be an election judge, but it also gave us time to find alternative polling locations. And for um, the the local June election, the August election, and the November election, November was a little bit easier because everybody knew that we would need as many polling places as possible. So the locations were a lot more gracious to us. But for the other two elections that year, um, we had to find a lot of locations that had never been used as polling locations before. Um, just because a lot of them were either churches that had completely shut down and uh, we didn't have anything that we could do about that, or they were uh, facilities for high risk individuals. We use um, a number of residential care facilities and um, the Columbia Housing Authority has two, two buildings that we use as polling locations too. And we came up just for speaking for Boone County, we had to come up with alternative sites. And then we also uh, really pushed for um, ways that we could make absentee voting more accessible. And that was kind of the second prong. In addition to moving the election to June, clerks were pushing really hard to find a way to make absentee voting more flexible to accommodate COVID-19. So we did fortunately get that through in one form or fashion um, and was signed in place in June. So by the time we had August, in November, we had a, a bit more flexibility when it came to absentee. So we were really trying to make absentee voting available to everybody. Uh, we did a lot more uh, satellite locations, which worked so well that I'm now integrating them into just our regular elections administration. So some parts of COVID-19 um, were we're really rough in doing the transition, but some of them we really want to keep because we found that voters really liked them and they added to the, the elections administration we were already doing. Thank you. Jane? Well, and, and one of the things that, as I thought about, you know, pre-pandemic um, versus post-pandemic, and even in the March presidential primary, we were beginning to make changes then in terms of, you know, like we added in nitrile gloves. I know, I think Boone County, you were doing some different things in terms of adding in additional things to clean the services there for the voters, but we were already trying to put hand sanitizer, uh, those things that were kind of before we saw everything change within that next week and a half, as Brianna mentioned, I remember we were talking a couple different times, like texting back and forth, like, oh my goodness, this is um, going to be a lot more difficult than we initially imagined as we thought about April moving to June. But, you know, Missouri, um, by and large, as far as I know, at least in terms of of, of, you know, this, um, you know, last hundred years, we've been a state that votes in person and our statutes direct that as you think about it. Well, clearly when the pandemic occurred, that changed that model in terms of, you know, you had to have um, a reason to be able to vote, um, not on the day of the election. There are six traditional reasons, which, you know, normally most people think about absence on the day of the election, um, for example, the other one that a lot of people um, think about is if you were incapacitated or confined due to an illness, you could then um, vote without coming on daily election. You didn't have to have a notary. Well, as we began to get closer to August and November, the legislature literally on the last day of session said, well, maybe that's not the best um, six reasons for a voter to be able to vote. And they added in that seventh reason that said, if you're considered at high risk by CDC standards, to con if you contract COVID, that your health would be at serious risk, then at that point, you can go ahead and vote that seventh reason without having to get a notary. Well, that along with the vote by mail um, reason that was given, and that was a little different in that if the CDC, center, CDC standards did not apply to you, then you could vote by mail, except you had to request to be mailed to you and you had to mail the ballot back, but you didn't have to state any type of reason, but you did have to get that ballot notarized. Um, that uh, basically back in 2016, about 10% of our um, voters chose to either vote in person or by mail. And what was interesting is almost two thirds of those voters voted in person prior to the day of the election. They would come here to the courthouse or election center to vote, or 
they would choose to go ahead and send that ballot back by mail. You go forward four years in the face of the pandemic, we had almost um, 30,000 voters that chose to vote um, by mail, whereas we had 10,000 voters in 2016. That was almost 20% of our overall registered voters for the county. And what was interesting is you flipped those numbers, or not quite flipped, but you almost went half and half in terms of the people that voted by mail and the people that came to vote in person, which when you think about administration, that was significant in terms of the change and what that meant for us in terms of the days leading up to the election. I think we're all hopeful that would make election day easier, but because of the overwhelming turnout that we had even on the day of the election, because of the interest in this election, it was still a significant burden even on election day, but we're so grateful that people were able to vote prior to that election because there would have been even longer lines um, during the day of the election. But fortunately, a lot of those lines were mitigated. We had a few high traffic points, but overall it was a much better day just by allowing about 20% of our voters to vote prior to the election. So that was kind of the change that we saw. And of course, you know, that was not only in our state and across um, the different candidates in our state, but that was nationwide as we well know. Mm, great. So uh, the question I would, another question I would ask then in that context is, you know, we, we pride ourselves on being a country based on universal suffrage, or that seems to be our principled goal on some levels, right? And it seems a silver lining in the pandemic, if you will, is that more people actually participated in the process, right? And so do you think this is a benefit uh, uh, by allowing this greater access in this manner, um, sort of to allow people to vote in this particular way, either in person, by mail, uh, and, and are there any sort of complications that come with that? I mean, so I will preface it by saying the County Clerks Association, which represents all of the 116 local election authorities, we're all in favor of no excuse absentee voting. Um, what that looks like, I think, differs in some people's minds. But, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, we were very similar to what was happening in Greene County. Uh, I wasn't really anticipating we'd have a 50-50 split of all of the people that voted absentee. Half of them still wanted to come to the office or to one of our satellite locations, and the other half wanted to do mail. Um, it's a big lift, I will say, from an elections administration standpoint, it's a big lift to switch to a mail scenario. Uh, we were really fortunate that we worked with a very good vendor who already printed our ballots and had kind of a framework in place from working with other counties that they printed ballots for. So we were able to kind of switch gears and switch to that from um, doing hand stuffing of the ballot envelopes like we used to, which uh, would not have been possible with the number that we had. But, um, you know, in-person absentee has its own list of of things that you have to change in the office to make it work but all of that is worth it to me i mean the the way that the just from a a administrative standpoint not even thinking about the the repercussions in the universal suffrage element of it it's just easier to get all of those people voted in advance because if they have an issue we have the ability to fix it then. They haven't lost their opportunity just on election day. If they find out that you know they need to do X, Y, or Z, they need to update their address, they don't just have that you know half an hour that they've carved out of their day on that Tuesday to take care of it. So we have the ability to provide better service. We have the ability to um, make it a more convenient experience because we can be open multiple days. We can do Saturday voting. We can you know, make it work for people. Uh, and we also then have the ability to mitigate the risk. So the other portion of 2020 everyone was looking at was what's gonna happen with the cybersecurity aspects of voting. And pegging everything on one day, working correctly and never having an issue is not a great uh, way of hoping for a successful model thing. Like it, it's just not, it's scary. It's scary and, you never know what can happen. So being able to spread it out over time mitigates that risk. Um, and just in general, I I would take all of those elements that we had in 2020 to um, help voters. I would I would make them all permanent if I could. If it were up to me. <laughs> and and just to add into that, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, one of the nice things about um, people being allowed to vote prior to the day of the election in terms of 
you know, that flexibility, it's not only good for the voter, but in terms of an office, for example, it can be the little things like your ballot coding is just literally less than a millimeter off, but you go to feed that in the machine. And even though you pre-test all your ballots, you don't have every deck that you had printed for the day of the election. They're certainly not being read on the day of the election. You have a lot better chance to catch that when people are able to come and vote in person, um, you know, because those are people that are voting prior to the, day of the election. Those ballots are going in the machine. You can't necessarily do that on the vote by mail, but that's really helpful. For example, um, you know, it's not uncommon that, you know, there might be a judge that has a court order that changes something. You can certainly adjust to that um, as well in terms of the things that happen prior to the day of the election. Doesn't necessarily help the in-person voting, but nonetheless, all those things in terms of flexibility that you have are helpful um, in terms of election administration um, when you're able to have that flexibility. And, you know, one of the things I think most um, county clerks and election boards do across the state is we still have the person show their ID when they come to vote prior to the day of the election. That's currently not in statute. I know there's some legislation that would require that, which the County Clerk Association supports. Um, but again, the election day experience is exactly the same as a person coming to vote on the day of the election. So think about it. When everyone comes to vote on one day, if you have any series of issues that happen on that one day, the ability, as Brianna said, to mitigate them becomes exponentially harder. And so it's a lot easier to figure that out prior to election day than on the day itself. Um, and so I, I think um, our legislature, as we've been having discussions with them, they've been seeing that um, and, and the potential importance of that. But right now, part of what we're seeing also um, in election administration is there's a lot of national conversations going on right now that we're also trying to work through because frankly, Missouri did it very well, but there's some that look at other states and they think they didn't do it as well as Missouri did. And so, you know, that's a challenge that we have right now in terms of saying we have a really good system in place. We can actually make it better if we can have more people vote prior to the day of the election. And of course, I think Randa mentioned it, you know, we support people not having to give a reason um, we think that it's important that if that option is going to be there six weeks out to election, let that option go forth. And so there's some important discussions going on about that. Um, one of the compromises is that they would still have to give a reason if they vote by mail. I don't have an issue with that. If that helps us get through the opportunity for people to come vote in person. But the, I think important thing about 2020 is it led into us being able to have these conversations now with the legislature and we have a lot more data to be able to show it works. To your point, David, was we had more people that voted in 2020 during a pandemic than we did prior to any other election year in terms of overall turnout um, as a state and I think in most counties as well. And so I think that, you know, has given confidence that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Sure. No, and that's right. And, and I think and I think you're right. I think there are a lot of terms that folks sort of misconstrue, right? Absentee voting, mail-in voting, voting early. Uh, voting on election day, right? I think folks sort of conflate everything that's not on election day. I think it's conflated into sort of one thing, right? That, oh, it, it's, it's all the same. And so it's great that you're, you know, so you're identifying these particular sort of different different kinds of voting sort of opportunities. Um, the next question then would be sort of going forward. We see a lot of legislatures around the country now beginning to change these voting rules, right? Uh, shortening the day. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll use Georgia as the model here of what I think is really kind of uh, problematic uh, on some levels, right? The ability to give people food and drink while they're on the line, constituting a, a misdemeanor potentially, shorting the time from nine o'clock to 8 p.m., right? No more sort of weekend voting, removing, which which is going to impact, some will say, have a detrimental impact on souls to the polls and so the black church voting and, and things of that nature. And so the question going forward is, is do you see these actions as counterproductive? Is this something and, and, and we have a couple of bills in our Missouri House uh, that are going forward about addressing sort of voting changes. And so, you know, what are your sort of opinions about that in terms of these particular processes sort of changing the nature of the practices right now? Well, and, and I think one of the things, and if any legislator would ask me, is if you go back and look at Georgia, Georgia's had issues for a number of years. You just go back and look at the way they did their election equipment, the way they did their cybersecurity. 
Um, they were woefully inadequate, even if you look at back at 2016 and 2017 in terms of the issues that were occurring there. And so I feel like in Georgia, they're trying to catch up where to the place where a lot of other states are. And I think when you look at that, issues that are being attributed to their voting laws in terms of people who vote prior to the, day of the election are being attributed to that versus I think when you look at election administration in general, they've really had some outdated practices and models that need to be brought up to date in terms of just how they administer it um, through their state laws. And that to me doesn't have anything to do with whether a person votes prior to the, day of the election. I think they were, those are things that take time. Just like if we suddenly went to a vote by mail model and that happened overnight, I guarantee you and Brandon agree, we would have significant issues in our state in terms of how that takes place, how that's conducted. And so they've had a lot of challenges, but I certainly don't want that die to be cast on other states and how we do things because um, I think in our state, we're the show me state, we did show the voters of the state that we can take um, you know, the changes that were given and do them very well because we have good um, practices in place. Um, we work together just like in a state. And I think Georgia has done many things well, like the programs that they had in terms of allowing people to vote without a reason prior to the election day. But unfortunately, because of some of the political dynamics that have been interwoven with that, I think a lot of those things are being attributed as to the challenges when really the challenges that they see have nothing to do with a person voting prior to the day of the election. Those are bigger. And, and frankly, transparency. I mean, I, I don't know how Brandon feels about this, but I've often thought when I looked at what happens for those states, they really needed to go to a, you know, communications 101 class in terms of how to handle the questions coming before you, how to be transparent, how to show people how the process works. Because I think sometimes, unfortunately, the way things were communicated to the press and to voters actually made it a worse problem than what it was. Now, I wasn't there. I can't personally attribute to that. But I know here in our county, and I think when you look across a lot of counties in our state, we are very open to the press. We're very open to being transparent. We try to make the process as visible as, as possible for voters. That gives confidence when a member of the press can call up and they can come watch and observe everything except how a voter votes. That's the one thing we're always going to protect is you're not going to be able to see how a voter votes, but you can actually come see the testing, the post-testing. There's a lot of things that give voters confidence that if you open up to that transparency and accountability, then I think voters have confidence. It's a lot harder to poke holes um, when things happen. And if they do, you can normally isolate them to that county or to that you know, particular election and how it's administered versus the state as a whole. So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of been kind of my thoughts about it. So I think there's two really unfortunate things that are that are happening that I have not frankly figured out solutions to either. One is that um, there is, and Shane kind of alluded to it, although I'm a little more pointed to think about things sometimes. Um, there's a big disconnect between what happens in the legislatures and what happens at a county clerk's office. So the um, the communication and trying to get legislation that represents what elections administrators want and um, and frankly, listening to elections administrators when they say, this is not a problem, why are you bringing this legislation forward? Um, that's that's also extremely difficult because there's not a lot of, um, you know, there's no crash course that, that people go to to learn about how elections are being done right now. But when laws are being written without taking that into consideration, then we start doing more damage to the process because there's not an awareness of what's already there. and um, the second issue is the the political side of things, which is that um, there's obviously political implications to changing election laws. It's not we're not just operating in a vacuum. We're not just running elections and saying, you know, oh, you know, when we pick this polling place, it's just a nice place with a big room and, and we can use that. There's context. There's history. There's things that we have to take into consideration, and um, that 
does make it challenging and it's something that I think uh, needs to be addressed more. It's something I would love to have local election administrator voices in as well. So when we're seeing things like Georgia and Kentucky and, and having these conversations, um, I'm not hearing the local administrative voices. And I think that that's really important too. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important when we're talking about what all these other states is, are doing is the context of it. I think um, Georgia has been embroiled in a very real political and racial fight for a long time. Um, but what I find very interesting is Kentucky, for example, who has a um, Republican Secretary of State and Democratic Governor, is getting a lot of praise today for this legislation that Kentucky is going to be passing. When you look at what the legislation is that Kentucky is passing, it doesn't go nearly as far as what you would think it was for the amount of positive attention it's getting. It's got three days of in-person early voting and excuse absentee. That's not something that I feel like if it were to be passed here, which we are, we would be thrilled if what we got passed here had, like Shane said, in-person, no excuse voting, and still male absentee voting. But that, I don't think anybody would be proclaiming that Missouri was making this wonderful process if we passed that law. So I think the context and the expectations on some of the states and the history of what these states have gone through um, plays into a lot of how we hear about and um, construct a narrative for what's happening. So uh, there's definitely an attack on voting rights issues, you know, whether they're um, trying to take away things that were already in place or add new things or, or whatever it is, elections are on the top of everybody's mind. Um, but I think that there, there are large missing pieces that uh, regardless of the, the pandemic and, and where we're moving, I think addressing the fact that so much politics is involved in elections administration and trying to get more local election authority voices in those conversations would be extremely helpful. Well, we're, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you sort of brought that up too about the relationship between the clerk's office and the legislature. There, there's a question in chat about, uh, and I'm going to pose it this way to bring up both our local legislature and sort of federal, right? So the, the question in chat is, would you welcome federal funding to support upgrades to voting infrastructure? And with that being said, you mentioned a lack of voices from those who are on the ground in those conversations about voting changes. Right. And so do you see a place at the table or would you sort of, you know, mandate, I mean, a representative from your organization? It sounds like the Clerdy County Clerks Association should have a representative at the table when talking about sort of such changes. And do you? So there uh, is there's a National Association of County um, and, and that National Association does have local election voices on it and they do have a seat at the table. But um, I think that we as local election administrators haven't really i mean i hesitate to say it this way but i don't think that we have recognized that we have power and a voice that we could utilize um i think that we have largely because we think of ourselves as administrators um have just tried to kind of stay out of things and and whatever happens, happens, and, and that's the way it is. But there has been a shift, at least I have seen a shift. A lot of states, um, county associations have been much more engaged in those discussions. And instead of being reactive to things that come up, have been much more proactive. And I know Shane can speak to that too, because he's been involved in some of those. Well, and what I was gonna say in terms of like the funding specifically, um, you know, most interestingly, since I became county clerk, is we have seen, you know, Congress appropriate funds that the, then the EAC has sent out to each of the states. Um, one of the things we have advocated for um, on more than one occasion, and I've talked with uh, Senator Blunt and his team there in Washington, you know, especially when he was chairman of rules, now he's the ranking member, is part of the challenge we have as local administrators is not just here in our state, but in states across the country, the money is sent to the Secretary of State, and then oftentimes the money does not get sent down to the county level. And I think we would like to see maybe a combination where some clearly go Secretary of State. You know, in most states, that's where um, the um, statewide election authority is housed. There's a couple other states where maybe the Lieutenant Governor in another office. 
Um, but clearly, we know the needs of our county best. And one of the things you hear from members of Congress, as well as people in Jefferson City, is that one of the strengths of our uh, election system in our nation is that it's decentralized. And so one of the things as we're having these conversations is how do you create uniformity in terms of you know, election technology, election standards, um, election best practices, but still let the local election official be able to have the most say in how those decisions are made. And, and that's a real challenge. And, and I think part of the problem that, that I see in terms of not just Washington, but Jefferson City, is it goes right to what Brianna was saying, is that elections are about politics. And I think a lot of people on both sides of the party have very honest conversations about how they feel about how elections should be administered. But then you get the political consultants and certain individuals and that's where the politics comes into it. And you're not able to have that honest debate back and forth. Um, for example, last year, when changes were being made to how we administer the August and November election, the county clerk association as a whole, and I have yet to meet a county clerk yet in our state or anybody with an election board, was not part of those conversations until literally the last about day and a half. Now, that didn't make any sense to any of us why conversations are being um, had between members of the legislature and others that did not include local election authorities. One of the simple things that could have been done was, for example, in the vote by mail, it didn't include electronic transmission of that request. So literally, if a voter wanted to vote by mail, they didn't, seventh reason did not apply to them, they had to make that request either in person or handwrite it and send it to this office. They couldn't fax it, they couldn't email it, Little things like that that could have made a much better experience for the voter were never part of the conversations because um, local election authorities were not included in those conversations. And I don't know that it was intentional. I honestly don't think it was intentional, but it's kind of that lack of common sense. If you're going to do something, talk to the people that it's going to have the biggest impact on. And that's something that we continue to try to faithfully have those conversations about with our legislators. And we've had a good I think year this year with both the House and Senate in terms of those conversations going forward. And we're going to continue to do that to make sure that our voice is at the table um, because we know our experience matters when those decisions are being made. Uh, yeah, that, that makes a good deal of sense and quite honestly, quite logical uh, to have those who are actually implementing the policy to be present. Um, and I want to sort of touch back on what uh, Brianna said. Um, this notion of voting is a, it's got a historical narrative around it around in, in, in every state and around the country. Um, it's got a political now bent to it. Um, the changing of rules in order to give advantages. I mean, it's coupled with gerrymandering. I mean, there are a whole host of ways in which voting is impacted. And so are there, are there looking at our potential changes or the proposed legislative changes, are there changes in there that you think are gonna have a detrimental impact? And you may not be able to answer this question, right? They're gonna have a detrimental impact on our voting processes, or there's some that are sort of very neutral but because of how they're being cast, are coming out with a very negative perception. I think we're both thinking about how to. <laughs> are you talking about the state legislation or the federal? The state legislation, yes, the state legislation. State legislation. Okay. Um, you know, right now, I think things are very fluid. You know, the House Bill 738 versus the Senate Bill 282 look very different right now in terms of their form. Um, one of the things that I think we appreciate is that Senator Dan Hageman was a former county clerk in years past. And so we have a really good working relationship um, with him. And of course, you know, like any, um, you know, legislative model, the Senate usually has a little bit more um, autonomy and authority and how they're able to structure things because of the power given to a member of the Senate as opposed to the House. But, you know, Chairman Shaw, and of course we have one of our former county clerks, Peggy McGaw, um, she's a state legislator now as well. And so they've been very sensitive. For example, 738, I don't know if you saw that originally, David, but it literally outlawed all tabulation voting equipment from all elections going forward. And not only could you not use that tabulation equipment, you could not tabulate ballots until after seven o'clock that night after they return from, and so 
that's the type of thing that we've been seeing that I think, you know, we have to have a lot of conversations with the legislature. For example, there's some provisions that were added um, in as amendments during the committee process that basically kind of create an antagonistic relationship on the cybersecurity front. Um, whereas we believe, I think as County Clerk Association, we need to be working local, state, and federal together to be able to figure out how we can best protect our elections from cybersecurity warfare, which we know is, is a great potential. Um, and one of the things we continue to tell them is, frankly, it's not the voting machines we're worried about, it's the check-in equipment. If you looked at what happened in 2016, they were trying to penetrate into the voter registration systems of states. They did it in Illinois. Those type of things we have to continue to educate. And not only that, if you're concerned about outcomes, let's start talking about risk limiting audits and things that we know work that are effective that bring the accountability and transparency to the process. And so um, we're continuing, I think, to see kind of the education level of members in House and Senate continue to rise as we have those conversations. But there's a lot of things happening um, in the in both piece of legislation. But I think right now, 282 is certainly, I think it hits, I think the issues, for example, um, it would allow voters to come and vote in person prior to the election without having to give a reason for three weeks. I think we see that as a win, it's something that we've been working with, with members of the House and Senate, Secretary of State's office, and it would ensure that you also have voter ID. It also takes away the presidential preference primary, um, and we probably don't have time to go into that, but a lot of us don't realize that when they vote in a presidential preference primary, it still has to go to the caucus process with each of the parties in our state. And in 2012, um, for example, in the Republican Party, um, both the Democrat and um, um, Republican um, national committees said to the state parties, you're having your primary too early. Therefore, if you um, go for the primary, those votes are not going to count when you become a delegate on the floor of um, both national conventions. So guess what? We had a presidential preference primary that meant nothing. And the voters on the Republican side voted for Senator Rick Santorum, but when the caucuses met, they voted for then Governor Mitt Romney to become the nominee. So that's an example of a lot of voters don't realize that, you know, President Kramer's primary is important, but the parties still dictate who the nominee is going to be. Those are things that would save election administrators a lot of headache, and it would save the state money, and we think it makes a lot of sense. So those are a couple of things that we like in both pieces of legislation that we see going forward. I think the other thing that's really important is um, any time, and sometimes it can be hard to remember because we live and breathe elections. And like Shane mentioned, the the two bills that we're looking at are not getting a lot of attention. I mean, those are not the ones that everyone's focused on. People are focused on photo ID right now. And that's a standalone bill that um, we are, we don't want associated with our legislation. And um, the, the thing that ends up happening sometimes is that we assume that voters are following it as closely as we are. And that's clearly not true. I mean, who would be following it as closely as we are? Um, the uh, issue is every time an election law changes, we have to do an education effort if we want the real benefits actually realized. So, um, I mean, that's the stuff that I think about when we're going through and we're looking at three weeks of in-person, no excuse absentee voting and six weeks of no excuse or six weeks of excuse mail. That's a pretty hard thing to explain in a very small amount of time that voters are going to be paying attention. And that was the challenge that we had in 2020 because there was this new mail-in ballot concept that had never existed before and really didn't make any sense because you had to do, like Shane said, you had to mail in the application. All the normal ways of voting absentee did not apply to it. Um, and the messaging gets very hard. And um, you try to work with advocacy groups that are doing their own messaging to try to make sure that we're you know, at least being accurate and consistent and that bad messaging is not getting out there. But that's the challenge anytime an election law changes. And it's it's one that I think is really important to for everybody to remember 
um, whether it looks like it's a win or not on paper or a loss or not on paper, a lot of it depends on how your county clerk is going to implement it and educate. And, um, you know, it's it's one of the down, I would say it's one of the downsides to the decentralization because there are things, whether we like it or not, that differ from county to county in terms of how a voter gets to cast a ballot. And we hear it too. I mean, we hear it when somebody moves to Boone or somebody moves to Green, they say, well, my county used to do it this way. Well, yeah, we all can do it a little different way within the confines of the law, but um, that's that's one of the, the greater challenges. And also one of the reasons why I think, you know, having an association is important for that kind of thing. But uh, I would echo what Shane said, obviously the, the in-person no excuse has the biggest benefits to voters. Um, a lot of the other elements of the bill are very, uh, very much just election administration oriented where you wouldn't think that it would cause a problem, but you know, it's not in the bill, but one of the things that we talk about a lot is what, why do we still need to have a four week out deadline for people that move from county to county in Missouri? For voter registration. We have a statewide voter registration system. If somebody's in Cooper County, moves across the line to Boone County, why do they automatically not get to vote in Boone County if they missed a deadline when they didn't realize that changing a county when they were registered voters in Cooper County didn't come over with them automatically? So those are the conversations that we have. That helps us on an administrative side but it also helps us because we don't want voters not able to vote. We don't, and we don't want them yelling at us, really. I mean, it's not fun to be on the receiving end of a conversation where at the end, the defense is, this is just what the law is. I'm really sorry about that. So um, I, I think education and communication to the electorate is really important in, in building those relationships, regardless of whether it's objectively a good or a bad law, communication has to be there. No, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, I'm looking at, you know, Missouri House Bill 334, 1065, 738, about all these changes, you know, thinking about more photo ID or photo IDs, right, eliminating any non-photo forms of ID for Missouri Bill uh, 330, House Bill 334, by being Missouri, federal government or military, getting rid of the uh, Secretary of State's requirement to inform the public of personal ID laws, um, changing uh, the nature of when folks can vote. I mean, so th it seems to me there are a lot of things that well, some might say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I mean, there seems to be a lot of tinkering with the process and, and some may, and some actually, I think, you know, um, rightfully so in some aspects may think, well then are you doing this to purposefully disenfranchise, right? It seems like a lot of the tinkering around these edges, around these rules and requirements has a very directed purpose and that purpose is not to increase involvement, but to decrease involvement and participation. I agree. And I get to say that because I'm the academic, not the county clerk. You know, I, mean, I, I get that. Okay. I said it too. I know, you know, I probably shouldn't say it, but I agree with you. Neat. Well, and, and I probably look at a little different lands as, as a former member of the, of the House, you know, I was there for three terms. Um, you know, I had sponsored voter ID back when I was in the past in terms of photo, um, you know, and I look at that as a legislator in that debate. Now I look at it as a county clerk. I see from a perspective of what Brianna mentioned is when you have an election judge that's getting screamed at by a voter um, because, for example, they didn't have the right type of ID when they show up. Um, you know, you see that from a bit of perspective. Doesn't mean that you still don't want a standard there. You absolutely do want a standard, but how those standards are implemented, it really matters because we have to have good, competent election judges. And I'll tell you, when election law is changed on election day that affects how an election judge is accustomed to administer that election at polling location, they're not going to take that type of. And and it's sad that they get verbally abused and chastised the way they are. But it only takes one or two voters like that in a polling location to one, not only make the election judges uncomfortable, but make all the voters uncomfortable. Um, you know, for example, a couple of years ago, um, we had a legislator that's trying again this year to pass a closed primary, which means you would have to register by the party um, that you identify with in order to be able to receive that ballot ahead of time. I'm not necessarily opposed to that, but 
the way that bill was written was not written well and would have caused real issues. And those types of things, when you're trying to say, okay, take off your lens that you're looking at this through, your experiences, your personal bias, and look at it from the view of what an election administrator and election judge has to be able to face during the day of the election. And you might see that a little bit differently. Um, but unfortunately, we've kind of reached this impasse where walls have been built between people, unfortunately, because they come from different backgrounds, different experiences, and we're not willing to kind of remove those when we have these discussions. And that's one thing I like about election authorities is that's a very, when we have our meetings or statewide association meetings um, as a group, those discussions come from a very different vantage point. And I've appreciated that from a county clerk perspective, working at the local level versus when things become very idealized and politicized when you're in Jefferson City by the party. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that either are wrong for what they're trying to do, but it's always good to have good, open, honest discussion where you don't feel like you cannot voice your opinion. And we've kind of entered into that era right now, um, frankly, in both parties and in each party, as well as between each party together when they have this conversation. And at the end of the day, the individuals that are impacted the most are the voters and the people we serve. And that's who we have to keep in mind when these conversations are going forward. Um, anytime we're thinking about changes. And I think that's, um, that I th that's a bunch of excellent points. And I think the other thing to add to that is, um, one of the, other reasons why education and our jobs are so important at the local level and why our voices are important to be brought into is just having the conversation about a lot of these bills gets in people's minds that the law is already what it is. I mean, we get questions all the time about, but I don't have a photo ID, so how do I vote? Well, we're not a photo ID state, but people think that we are. Or people see something on the news that talks about early voting and now we have early voting and no, we have absentee voting. That's not early voting, but Kansas has early voting. And so because of the, the media bleed over, um, then we end up taking those calls too. So um, just the, the impact of having conversations at the state level and at the federal level sometimes has that same impact on voters that it affects how they think about an election and whether they want to participate regardless of what the actual law is. And so having the conversations and, and educating people is just as important sometimes. Well, I'm going to say something here that's very contrary to federalism. Would it be appropriate then to have a national, you know, voting on election day as a national holiday, right? Where that's a day where folks can vote, Folks don't have to go to work. Um, having set rules that are set down by the federal level as to what is what is early voting, what does early voting look like? What are the procedures and the processes, right? I think about the, the rules here in this new bill or others about you've got to receive all the ballots on election day. Well, you guys were just talking about all these things that are getting mailed in and all these ballots and the time limit where you can't open them until a certain period of time. These seem to be very restrictive in sort of time space. Does there need to be just something more uniform nationwide that allows that basically doesn't allow all these sort of individual statewide countywide sort of um, uh, different applications. I think I will say, and I always feel like this is an unpopular opinion. I'm not a fan of making election day a national holiday because I think that it has undue burdens on um, people that have service jobs that can't take time off. It still ends up impacting people that can't vote. Um, because now, you know, national, national holidays don't mean everything shuts down in the whole world. And so all of those, all of those people still can't vote. So that's why I think having expanded access, like no excuse absentee is more beneficial for, for more voters. Um, so that's how I feel about that particular thing. Um, nationally, I think, I think that there could be a role for setting floors. I think that the Voting Rights Act is an amazing way of um, especially strengthening the Voting Rights Act or HR4 are good ways of making sure that really terrible things aren't happening at the 
local level or at the state level and making sure that there are teeth in that to to enforce it when something does go awry in a in a state or in a local jurisdiction are really important um but when it comes to the actual administration of things I think we have to speak at the federal level in very broad terms, in very um, almost in vague terms, so that the states and the locals are still allowed to um, work within whatever kind of structure is set up. Because I will say, partly because we don't have the COVID-19 reason in absentee anymore, but also partly because April elections are just low turnout elections. And as much as I try to make sure that they're higher turnout, they're just not a general November election. I've had 40 people come into the office to vote absentee. It makes it really hard to justify saying, well, you have to be open every weekend for the one voter that comes in. We were open on Saturday. Um, the We always are open on Saturday before the voter registration deadline and nobody comes in. We use it as a catch up day. So um, mandating things, especially on county budgets, sometimes uh, makes me nervous, but having a, a floor to work off of, I think is a good thing. Well, and the one thing that I like about federalism is, you know, frankly, I was speaking at our Green County Lincoln days recently, and I was going through, this is how we administer an election. This is what you need to know and I said, I'm not here to address what happened in the States because I wasn't there. And I had a person towards the end, you're really upset and said, well, I don't care about anything you just said, which was interesting. I just want to know what you're going to do about what happened in, you know, November. And my point back to them was, you know, and I'd already said this, is that if people in these other states are upset, our founding fathers through the Electoral College gave each state the right to be able to put forth who they want to be part of their Electoral College, represent them when they go to cast, you know, their votes for who the next president would be. What just happened? I, reason, I think we ended up losing Shane in the middle of a statement. just so that it's very clear that was not purposeful it looks like no. Shane's internet may have dropped just so we are clear is he uh, have the ability to sign back on i sent him a text too there we go oh we lost you for a moment there shane <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, i don't know what happened i was i'm actually plugged in through our system i'm not on wi-fi um so i don't know what happened there so are we still live with the audience? We are. A couple more minutes. We are. Great. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I was saying is that it is important that if in terms of the states and states' rights, if the voters that state are concerned, they can go to the legislature and they can change their voting laws. And the point is, I don't want to take away that right because part of the uniqueness of what our founding fathers understood is that we want to protect the voice of those who are not in the majority just as much as we want to protect the voice of those in the minority. And our electoral college was set up so that all states, regardless of the size, would have a voice. And, and that's important. And so my point to the, this person was, if you have a concern, you need to reach out to your friends in other those states and have them go to address the legislature. But it's not my business to go to any other state that had a concern and tell them how to run their elections. That's up to the voters of that state. And that's exactly what we want in a participating process that we have here in our nation as a republic, is that it's up to the citizens of those states to voice their concerns. And if they don't have a concern, the state can send whoever they want because that's the right of that state. And that is left up to each state to decide how they do that. And I think we need to continue to protect that as we go forward as a nation. No, and I think I certainly think this is a very valid point and well taken, right? I, I think folks would say though that you know there are a couple of opportunities where we see a number of, of avenues where folks are disenfranchised and we don't get that kind of participation, right? And I think one of the good things coming out of the pandemic, quite honestly, was the fact is that we finally had this sort of massive outpouring of participation in a process that we value so dearly. Um, so we're at the end of our time, but I want to sort of leave it with you guys with, with sort of a final opportunities for final comments. 
talking about you know, the right to vote, particularly in Missouri, policies and practices, and, and what do you see, I don't know, as, as challenges? What do you see as, as points of sort of, of pride that you do, uh, things like that going forward in this sort of post-pandemic era and moving forward? You want me to... Oh, okay. I'm on mute there. Okay. Um, you know, I think one of the things I continue to say to individuals as we think about elections is don't always assume the worst first. Um, that was one of the things we saw back in November is when an issue arose, people immediately jumped to the worst conclusion. You know, part of the um, thing that I love about elections is that it's we the people, but we the people, there are mistakes that are made. They're unintentional. Um, you know, we have to let the process work and understand that if we're going to have elections where we the people to vote and we have people that are there, you know, 14, 15 hours out of the day, sometimes longer, get two to three hours of training. Let's be patient with that. And then at the same time, let's not take the worst case example, of what happened and design the law in order to address the worst case example, but rather let's look at the best case examples and say, how can we bring the worst case example and bring them forward so they can be like the rest in terms of how elections are administered? And that's one of the things of, you know, even as legislature, I was never opposed to no excuse absentee voting. I often joke, I'm a Republican. I don't want the government to know what I'm doing. So I don't want to have to give a reason. And I think, you know, when I think about it, I'm like, as a party, we should think about that, you know, that we, we pride ourselves in the individual and independence. And I think if we're going to have six weeks where we um, can vote, let's let the voter be able to do it on their terms. And yet at the same time, make sure it's safe, make sure it's secure, all those things that are important in terms of the outcome of the election. Because what we want to give the voters is the confidence after the election is certified. Mind you, you have two weeks for certification. Election night is uncertified. But when we certify that election, that the voter and how they voted is exactly what we certified. And that's what gives confidence in the American people, whether it's a local, state, or national election, in terms of, I may not have voted with that person, but if that's what my neighbors voted for, I'm okay with that. And I can come back in two years and be part of that conversation again. And that's what I tell people is, I never like being left out of a conversation that I wanted to be part of. That's what voting is. We don't want to leave anybody out of that conversation. We want everybody to be part of that. And so we have to be very thoughtful about how we do that. Thank you. Brianna? I would say um, at a much, much more local level, get to know who your county clerk is. I mean, I, I tell people that all the time. Um, reach out to us if there's an issue. I spend most of election day trolling social media to see what issues are coming up because I know people are not going to call me to tell me about them. And I think it's so important to uh, make sure that if you have a voting concern that you're bringing it to our attention because similar to what Shane said, mistakes happen for one thing, but also sometimes you can get so tunnel visioned about making sure that one thing works one way, that there may be an honest miss of something that we need to do. And bringing it to our attention um, is very welcome. I mean, I wanna have those conversations with people if they feel like they're having an issue or if there are recommendations that they have. I tell people too, um, thankfully we've had really good experiences with our polling places and we've been able to continue using most of them throughout the years. But if you don't like your polling place, let me know what's in your area. I mean, we we drive around and we look for places that could be potential polling places. Um, and that it, I don't think people always know how. Like, I'm, I'm not over exaggerating when I say that I have staff in my office that will come in after a weekend and say, oh, my gosh, I was south of town and I didn't realize there was this huge building out there. We should look to see if that can be a polling place. They weren't working. They weren't out there like doing something for the office. They happen to be, you know, hiking in, in uh, like Grindstone and saw something that they didn't know was there. So there, we care and we're trying to constantly think of those kinds of things, but we are always open to feedback and um, I am trying to do more to solicit that feedback as well. But uh, in addition to that, I think it's also really important to um, pay attention to what is happening in your own legislature 
and what laws are being discussed. Uh, it's hard even for us as you know, engaged as we want to be in everything for us to even know, like Shane said, it's a fluid situation right now, even with the legislation that we want and have had some role in trying to put forward. Uh, we still don't always know 100% what's going to happen with the final product. So it's really important to just continually be um, involved in that. And then also just, just vote. I just, everybody should vote and make sure that you're registered, make sure that you're up to date. Uh, you can check your voter registration on the Secretary of State's website, or if you're in Boone County, you can do it on ours and update your stuff. But you'd be shocked at the number of people that uh, they get registered, they vote in November, and then they never change their address again. And we just get returned mail from them. And it's just, you know, like huge buckets of returned mail right after the November election as we're preparing for April because people don't realize that they need to update their address. And both Shane and I are in college towns, so it happens more to us than it happens to some of the other counties. But um, we are always excited. I love seeing people that have voted for the first time. People come in and take selfies when they vote, and that's fantastic. Um, I just would love if more voters um, came to us with issues and allowed us to help them work through it and, and fix them so that all other voters could hear it too. Because a voter may feel one way and it may impact a bunch of other people and telling us helps make sure that it's helpful for everybody. Well, thank you both. I mean, this has been great. So I certainly want to sort of, you know, um, reinforce that for folks. Hey, they just said to reach out to them. You got issues with voting? <laughs> Call your county clerk, right? I mean, it's, I mean, I think that's fantastic, right? It's definitely very encouraging to hear and also to hear your perspectives about where we are um, and where we're going. Um, and, and quite honestly, to hear of, I guess, the collective wisdom of county clerks who are actually have thought and sat down together. Um, of course, I would wish that legislators would hear more and take your advice, which would be fantastic too. Um, but once again, I really wanna thank you um, for your time. I wanna thank you for giving your opinion, your perspective, and talking about the right to vote in Missouri and the policies and our practices. It's been uh, certainly very educational and greatly appreciated. So. Uh, and for those who, who have been who have listened with us, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, once again, this is a Milton Center event, sort of bringing in conversations about incredibly important topics. And this topic is actually about the one of the the third prong or the second one, if you will, of our center. This is about citizenship, right? I mean, the right to vote is a marker of citizenship, of belonging, um, and it's important having your voice being heard. So, thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you so much, Shane. It's really appreciated. Thank you for having us. This has been fantastic. Yeah, yeah thank you. I enjoyed it as well. Right. Thank you all.